Hey everyone! This time we're going to be looking over Famicom cards. We're going to compare them to NES cards, both the licensed and unlicensed ones, and just kind of see what the difference is between the two. I'm not going to go into like different markings and labels and other weird stuff that I found on these cards, mostly because I just didn't find any. I'm sure there are some out there, but in the small collection I have, I just couldn't find those. So far in my collecting of these cards, it's been kind of fun, mostly because I've gotten to see a lot of the games that we didn't get here in the U.S., and it's kind of cool to see some of the alternate, you know, cover art between the U.S. ones and the, um, the Japanese version, whereas the Japanese are more, like, cartoony and more anime, and the U.S. ones sometimes are kind of crap, like with the Mega Man cart. Growing up, I didn't really know that you know, the Famicom really existed. I knew Nintendo was a Japanese company, but I just didn't really know a lot about the Famicom cards. So when you look at those and then you compare them to the NES cards here, you see a huge difference. The standard NES cart usually comes in gray, or in some cases, like with Zelda and with Link, it's in gold. And you don't see the same kind of creativity with these cards that you would see in the Famicom cards, unless you look at the unlicensed games. With the unlicensed games, you just saw them go crazy. You had different styles depending on the companies, you had them coming in a few different colors, not the same variety as the Famicom cards, but you definitely saw them being a little bit different, a little bit more unique than the NES ones. I think having a more uniform look was probably part of, you know, Nintendo of America's way of kind of separating itself from the toy market, even though they still ended up in toy stores, so I don't really know how well that worked. As you saw earlier, the Famicom carts come in just all different colors. And I mean all different colors. It's kind of been crazy finding these, but they looked more in line with toys than the actual NES cards. And one thing I noticed is each company seemed to have their own mold for NES cards. You have Bandai's with like their more rounded edges. You had um, Jalico and Irem that had their names imprinted on the actual cards, as well as Bandai and then Namco as well. So it was just kind of cool to see those things and then compare them to their NES counterparts, which looked very different. Well, the Nintendo cards, they have their own kind of uniform shape. They'll come in every color imaginable. And that's just one thing I found really cool, and I kind of wish more NES cards had done this. I kind of get why they stuck with it. Like I said, they're probably trying to move away from the toy market. But once that kind of stopped being an issue, they really should have just, you know, gone with it and just had them in a whole bunch of different colors and everything like that. It would have probably been a lot better. I do want to mention this really quick. Even within a company, they'll have, like, different styles of their own cartridges. You'll see this with, like, Namco and also with IRM. They'll have like a different style. Namco's will have some bigger cartridges like uh, Splatterhouse you see there, but Irem will have them with actual LED lights on them, which is kind of cool. These lights were really kind of the thing that got me into really wanting to collect Famicom cards. I picked up Schoon because I didn't want to pay the ridiculous price that it was here in the U.S. for an NES cart, so I got a Schoon cart for the Famicom. And it had this little LED light on it. And I was really kind of amazed by that. And at first I didn't really know what it was until I plugged it in and bam, it lit up. I, I was just kind of like, wow, that's... I wonder what other crazy things are out there for the Famicom. And then inevitably I ended up getting a couple of complete in box games. And I start noticing even the boxes aren't in any uniform shape. You see, like, Namco's Pac-Land is smaller than the Bandai Namco Dragon Ball games. And those are smaller than the Nintendo boxes. It's just kind of crazy to see that, and it made me sort of wonder why. And then you'll also find a few clamshell cases, like here with one of the Koei games. 
that kind of makes a little bit of sense, and I'll show you that in just a second. But you compare this to the NES, where they all have like the same uniform box for the most part, unless they want to cram some other things in there. So this Koei game, it's the, the cartridge is obviously bigger, because most Koei games have a much larger circuit board. And that's just because they're bigger games. But it also comes with just a really thick book and some maps and everything like that. This kind of reminds me of some of the Sega games that EA ported where they needed like a 50 to 100 page manual for you to be able to play all the games and have it kind of get everything across that it needed to get across. Now let's kind of take a little bit more of a look at these two carts. Uh, these are both Legend of Zelda. One is obviously NES, the other one is, you know, the Famicom cart. The Famicom cart is, I believe, a 60-pin connector, whereas the NES cart is a 72-pin connector. So they did that, which I think was probably to help with region locking, just to kind of cut down on people importing games, I think. Or it had something to do with the hardware. I'd have to look more into that, and that might be a subject of something later on. We'll see if that actually works out or not, but it's kind of cool to look at these two. So I think most people have seen this by now, but this is the Famicom. It looks very different from the NES, mostly because it's a top loader, and it looks more kind of like a Fisher-Price toy, if you ask me. I like this design a lot more, and I kind of wish that the NES had been, you know, more like that. Especially when you find out that the way the NES was designed, it sort of has its design flaw, which causes its blinking light problem. You're not going to see that with a top loader like this. And then there's the NES, which looks a lot, a lot different, because they kind of wanted it to blend in a little bit more for the American audience. They didn't want it to look like a video game console. Most of them were all top loaders at the time. The NES is that weird toaster thing where you have to insert the cartridge, press it down, and then kind of hope that it works for the most part. It's kind of a weird decision, and the way that it would actually you know, bend the pins and everything, it could cause them to loosen over time, and that can mess with the connections and give you the blinking light problem. The NES would get a redesign into the NES 2, which was a top loader. It did have a few issues with it, and honestly, I prefer the toaster one once you get past like the blinking light situation, which is fixable now, but at the time, you know, it, it really was not. Unless you knew something about it or knew how to take it apart or get it fixed, you were kind of screwed, which was basically what happened with me and my family's NES. So that's going to wrap it up, guys. There's a little bit more to it, but I don't really have any more NES games or really Famicom games that I want to share. Uh, my collection for Famicom is pretty small, but it's been kind of fun picking these up and just seeing all the differences between the two systems and their different games and everything like that. Please let me know what you think. Uh, if you guys want to see another video like this, or do you want me to play more of the Famicom games and actually go into the you know differences between the systems, just let me know, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.